Good afternoon, everyone. So I take pleasure in inviting all our faculty uh, for the present session. So can we have, please, uh, Dr. Alok Pandey, Dr. P. Subhanarayan, sir, Dr. Kale, sir, Dr. Mohan Desai, sir. Friends, at the end of this session, we also have one company-sponsored session by our trade partner, which will be presented by Dr. Raut, sir. So, all of us will have some complexities when it comes to our hip joints and let's see how we can solve those complex acetabular reconstructions. May I invite our first speaker, Dr. Alok Pandey, for analysis of defect and role of 3D printing. Thank you, Akash. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to Vairag Organizing Committee for inviting me for this talk. So I'll be speaking on analysis of acetabular defects and role of 3D printing. Every year, around 1.4 million total hip arthroplasties are performed worldwide and the number is expected to grow significantly by 2030. Aseptic loosening and osteolysis continue to be major challenges in hip reconstruction surgery. Planning surgical treatment for these conditions require an accurate preoperative characterization of bone loss. So, what are the indications for acetabular revision? Symptomatic aseptic loosening, instability, periprosthetic infection, and progressive osteolysis. Coming to the anatomy, the acetabulum. The anterior column is composed of anterior ilium, anterior wall, anterior dome of the acetabulum, and superior pubic ramus. The posterior column is composed of greater and lesser sciatic notches, posterior wall, posterior dome of the estabulum and ischial tuberosity. Medial teardrop is created by distal anterior and posterior horns of the articular surface, which is a radiological finding. Now, which weaves are important for planning the estabular defects? The radiological weaves, X-ray of pelvis with both hips shoot through lateral of that hip to detect the acetabular component version, obturator and iliac weave to evaluate both the columns, and CT scan is needed to evaluate the volumetric bone loss. There are many classifications available for the acetabular defect. The common ones are the Paparowski classification and the AOS classification. Uh, I'll be talking about the Paparowski classification. It identifies which acetabular supporting structures are deficient. It also predicts which biological augments and synthetic component would be needed at the time of revision surgery. So there are four criteria uh, which are needed for the Paparazzi classification. So if we see here, the green bracket will show the center of hip migration. We have to see it from the opposite hip. The amount of ischial osteolysis is shown here by yellow rectangle. The amount of teardrop osteolysis is seen here by red arrow and the position of implant relative to the collar line is marked by the blue line. What is migration of hip? The superior migration is quantified by measuring the distance in millimeter of hip center relative to superior obturator line. Superior and medial migration indicates greater involvement of the anterior column, whereas superior and lateral migration indicates greater involvement of the posterior column. Ischial osteolysis represents bone loss from the inferior aspect of the posterior column. The amount of ischial osteolysis is determined by measuring the distance from most inferior aspect of lytic area to superior obturator line. Uh, the types of Paparowski classification, I will be showing a video model here. The normal acetabulum, this type 1 is focal contained defect, both the columns are intact. That is type 2A, 
in type 2 a uh, in type 2 the center of migration is less than 3 cm and both the columns are intact type 2 has a b and c subtypes this is type 3 a in which the center of migration of hip is more than 3 cm in 3 a and 3 b both Now coming to these individual types, as I said, type 1, focal area of contained bone loss, acetabular rim is intact, anterior and the posterior columns are intact, no ischial or teardrop osteolysis. Type 2, both the columns are intact, 2A is superior plus medial wall defect, 2B is less than one third of the superior rim is deficient, 2C is broken collar line with the columns intact. Type 3, A, up and out defect, 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock position. And type 3 B is up and in defect from 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock position. Complete destruction of teardrop and migration medial to the collar line happens in 3 B. This is one of the papers for the classification of Paparovsky in CORR. Now what is role of 3D printing? 3D printing is used in complex revision arthroplasty. 3D printing is also known as additive manufacturing. 3D printed custom made acetabular components have become more common for Paparovsky 3A and 3B defects. This is a paper in Indian Journal of Orthopedics. They have shown a follow up of 7 years without any loosening or migration of the component, uh, 3D printed acetabular component. This is another paper in the journal Metals. This is just a flow chart to show how it is done from data acquisition to the product delivery. Patient specific 2D CT MRI data can be converted to 3D printed models. Key advantages are perfect fit, patient specific, predefined position, angle and thickness of cuts and drill, reduced surgical time. Benefits of 3D printing are reduced blood loss, reduced time under anesthesia, improved recovery time and improved understanding of the problem. I uh, will be showing one case of mine in which only the 3D printing was done just to know the size of the establisher component. 48 year female, RA positive, patient's height was 4.4 inches and the weight was 28 kg, BMI was 16.5. This was her pre-op gait, patient was household ambulator and hardly able to walk, lean and thin patient and the left side was done first as she was more symptomatic on the left side. This is her 8 months post-op without walker or without stick. Quantification of bone loss is must preoperatively. Adequate imaging in the form of required radiological waves and CT should be done preoperatively. In depth analysis of properties of 3D printed implant is highly suggested in order to avoid unexpected high grade failure like metal on metal implants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pandey. I hereby invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Suganayan, sir, the Khali of Orthopedics, presenting the Jumbo Cups, the Khali of Acetabulum. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thanks indeed for this invite to be at the Bayrock, a grand meeting at a grand venue. My brief is to talk on the bone loss in hips, the jumbo cup as a solution, and I shall just stick to it since others are covering the other subject. Major bone loss is a huge problem, like my predecessor just mentioned. Oftentimes, the directional migration of the component, which is loose and rocking, adds to this. Added to this is the osteolysis and the wandering cups. These subsequently propagate if you let it and not pick up early the loosening and try to procrastinate and delay the revisions. I mean, there are various reconstructive options possible. We have gone through these eras of using the fixed uh, cages to bone graft reconstructions to the current day uh, wedges and uh, augments. Acetabular impaction bone grafting has been a huge thing. I think this is one of the one, one wonderful technique, very difficult to execute, but as I think has a huge role, very demanding and technically you need a high volume of grafts. In short, revision of acetabular surgery, the workhouse has been the non cemented cups. We have had intense experience in the revision, the primaries, and it extrapolated into the re revisions also. And if you look at the registry data, 95% survival at 15 years and risk of re-revision re very much less with the non-cemented than with the cemented. So what is the jumbo cup? It's not, a it's not a device, it is not a concept, it is just a concept. 
a substitute method for filling the bone defects and the acetabular uh, cavities which we find all along. So we position appropriately the cup in a stable situation to fill the defects, sometimes bypass the defects and sometimes we achieve it with just raising the center of hip rotation, which today we know in the revision situation to a point it is not bad. But for the sake of definition and documenting, I think uh, there have been some definitions, Whaley and co-workers, co uh, they had defined as the elevation beyond 65. That is, men, more, the cup size more than 65 or the women more than 61, they defined as the jumbo cup, whereas the Mayo Clinic felt 66 and 62, just a play of numbers. But in short, it must be at least about 10 to 12 millimeters larger than the parental side or the normal side for that individual. So in that regard, in India, if you take average size of 50, even 60 probably is a big jumbo cup. To, to use that, uh, such a cup in normal situations is abnormal. But in the revision situations or in the bone loss situations, I think it makes a lot of sense. So the jumbo cups, what you have to essentially see is that there are a lot of column erosions like you saw in the previous talk. Uh, there may be a superior or a medial migration, what I call the directional migration. Based upon that, you see the feasibility, whether you can overcome the defects just with a cup. Some benefits of the jumbo cup concept or putting a large cup in the defect is it maximizes the contact area. There is an area of integration is much better. You obviate the need for graft, augments, or any of the things. Post dissipation is very good. You would be able to restore the hip center if you use a jumbo cup in most situations. And the bigger the cup, you also have the possibility to put a large head. But the fundamental dictum is cup fixation happens between the columns, anterior and posterior. You need to help have some sort of a diametric fit in any axis. It need not be AP as such. It can be from 9 to uh, the 5 or the 7 to 2, whichever direction. And then the other rest of the deficiency you assess and you decide. So you keep expanding the cup. You may expand a little... But the stop point will be your column contact. Beyond that, if you go, you then shatter the columns. So beware of this when you do it. You must be centric in your reaming, not eccentric in your reaming. The key points in the planning basically is it identify the location, identify the segmental deficiency. I like to use the dial of a clock, you know, which gives us a better understanding whether it is from what point to what point. Anterior column and anterior wall deficiencies usually do not pose a problem. You still have a little bit of superior and the posterior superior segments, you can still afford to get a good fixation. The floor migration on this, uh, I think very important uh, concept is only consider a graft if you have to lateralize completely. Whenever you find sort of a small crescent on the medial wall, you are rather reasonably certain that is the end point on the medial side. You can expand the cup as much as the columns allow you and cover the rest with the graft. Always it's a race, so that's why I suggest you use the highly porous cups for speedy integration. But accessory augmented fixation with screws is often a crucial thing when you use it. But do not hang on a loose cup with some couple of screws, they will always fail. You have to have some fixation and then additional screws to hold it. Just one example of a large cup which you have fixed in this. There are two other strategic points you have to make it, restore the hip center or whether you are going to accept the high hip. It all depends upon the pattern and the geometry of the socket. Some limitations and disadvantage of these jumbo cups is, is you ream the bone to the, uh, often to get a hemispherical surface but you don't restore any bone and limited applicability in very oblong situations where you can't have a diametric fit. The disadvantage also is that when you really oversize too much, Beware of the fact that it can have an ileal irritation. So ileosuous irritation could be a major problem and potential hip elevation. And uh, this probably causes some concern we have seen and then you have got to revisit because patients are rather very unhappy. Be aware of this. In this, you have to use, look at alternate cups or the eccentric bores in the line, uh, cups inside liners also. So Jambuka revision cups in the retrospective review, it is seen that if you have that problem of a huge, you could probably downsize. Bone grafting is a huge way to downsize it along with the additional of the rings, which have given much better results than isolated graft in a non cemented cup. The current non cemented cages, I think, I suppose, give us the access to do these aspects. One example you can also try to do with the augments, which will be discussed in detail in the subsequent cups. 
So jumbo cup prepared for moderate to severe acetabular defects with a large cup have yielded good results. Uh, and in conclusion, I can also say a pelvic discontinuity is another great situation where the concept is being more and more applied. The techniques is a very different technique where you expand. Mind you, this pelvic discontinuity has to be a chronic pelvic discontinuity with a probably floor soft tissue which should be having as a check rein or the hinge over which you look at it. It's also another good solution. So in summary, I think successful use of jumbo cups is now well established in the revision surgeries. Diametric hose bone impaction is really vital. Crucial sex cover is necessary. Highly porous cups is recommended. And supplemental screws should always be part of the game. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Surya Narayan, for excellent. I now invite our next speaker to speak on trivacular metal augments. Is it a clear winner? Uh, the speaker is Dr. Abhijit Kale. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So from the jumbo cups, we move to the philosophy of trabecular metal augments. So the Wayne Paprosky classification is useful and has been described in detail in the previous talk. So when it comes to the management options in uncontained acetabulum defects, the options available are either structural allografts, anti cages like Bruce Schneider's or others, or bilob cups, a triflange components, or the porous metal augments. So if we go into the details of these augments, the configurations in which the augments can be placed are either as a flying buttress, or a dome augment, or a footing augment. The flying buttress augment is essentially used for a superolateral rheum defect as seen in Paprosky's type 3A. The concept has been derived from a civil engineering concept, uh, the goth uh, mainly from the Gothic architecture, where it tends to support something that and prevents it from falling down. And the thing which supports is not in contact with the ground, hence the term flying buttress. So, in a presence of a superolateral defect, if one uh, weight bears, there is a chances of the cup migrating superiorly and outwards. So to prevent that, if a support is given on the superior and outer aspect, this force can be negated. So when this cup was fit in, one can see that it's rotationally unstable and one can appreciate a superolateral defect. So a augment is placed on it. The problem is only selective size augments are available starting from size 52, 56 or 62 and you will have to select one which fits best for the patient for that size. Then the template is initially held with K wires over which a augment can be placed. All this is done with the trial cup in C2. Over the guide wires, with a good purchase, then the augment can be fixed with the screws. And finally, one can go ahead with placing the cup and try to get an entero posterior capture, or L. Dr. Surya Narayanan says, a multi axial capture. Coming to the second configuration is the dome augment configuration, which is used for a superomedial defects that is Paprosky's type 3B, the elliptical defects. So this was a 55 years old male uh, post-infection sequelae. And again, he had that elliptical defect, which was managed with this dome augment. And then we proceed with the conventional replacement. Coming to the third type, which is the footing augment. This is usually used when there is a medial defect. That's type 2C. So if we go through this, usually flying buttress is indicated for type 3A defect. However, type, uh, the dome shape augment is preferred again in type 3A or 3B or even 2B, whereas footing augments are essentially preferred in uh, type 2 defects as well as 3B defects in combinations. Coming to a case of acetabulum augment used in pelvic discontinuity, this was a 40 years old female 
who was on steroid and had a bilateral avian hip and had undergone a thr and came to us with this x-ray with a painful limp and shortening a 3d ct scan was done to analyze the defect the cup was seen floating and it was taken out along with the liner and the screws then the pelvic discontinuity the posterior column was fixed using a plate since the posterior column is a weight bearing column it's prioritized to fix that and then the after placing the trial cup one can appreciate again the defect so this time the column augments were used along with a slim placed underneath it and that was the buttress augment with a trial cup a allograft was also used we would have preferred using in this case also the medial augments however they were not available another important concept to understand in uh, acetabulum augment is the concept of unitization to prevent micro motion at the junction of the cup and the augments one should put in a cement and make the entire construct as one this prevents the uh, wear and tear thereby preventing aseptic lysis of the component the next technical issue is what one should put first whether the cup first or the augment first so it depends upon the capture that you get if you are having a good capture with the cup go ahead with the cup first and place a augment over the defect if you don't have a good uh, capture of the cup then go ahead with the augment fixation first so why this particular trabecular augments over a period of time it has been realized that it helps in conserving the host bone and also prevent uh, provides a good structural support also one is able to cover these defects now different companies have go- come out with different options uh, of augments so smith have nephew have come out with this blade augment options where one can appreciate for that large superior defect one can place these augments now they are where one has the option even of putting a locking screws in in a using variable angles and can get the best support possible so the advantages of trabecular metal augments are they increase the potential for bone growth they minimize the stress shielding they decrease the risk of graft fracture and graft resorption which is seen when we use a allograft and they also improve implant stability there is no risk of disease transmission as again seen with allografts when one reviews the literature our belief in this is reinforced uh, however in one uh, ex vivo study it was shown that the ingrowth seen was up to 2.6 mm in selected cases also the survival rate at 10 years is close to 92% so why this again uh, particular trabecular metal in this area so there are more than 300 studies to support the use of this there is a decrease re revision rate they support bony in growth and there is less possibility of requiring uh, revisions so the take home message is extensive acetabulum defects can be managed using these augments they are alternative to allografts and they decrease the risk of causing a disease transmission or resorption one has to understand the concept of unitization and creating a monolithic construct and they help in conserving the host bone thank you thank you dr kale It's wonderful talk uh, i'll invite dr mohan desai to speak on kgs and mesh dar kya ge jeet hai thank you i had uh, previous talks and uh, the question comes to our mind is whether these kgs are uh, uh, Should be thrown in the basket. Uh, there are role of cages in the acetabular defects, and they are still uh, in vogue. The standalone cages with the cemented curve, with impaction grafting, or with the massive allografts, is going down. Uh, but uh, the cup and cage construct can be used in pelvic discontinuity. Continuity. There are many other <coughs> ways to uh, use these cages, which we'll discuss. And the uh, cages 
which can take up uncemented cups or few cages even have potential to osho integrate. So these are various types of cages that we can still use. Uh, they are, are they outdated? Uh, they are time tested actually. The advantage is, uh, is that it, they act as an internal splint or the bridge till the biology takes over. They protect the graft from stresses they achieve and uh, the cup is cemented so it is uh, independent of uh, the, uh, the way the cage is inserted, easy to insert. But disadvantages is that is there is no biological potential, they cannot osho integrate and there is uh, as highlighted there is midterm failure because either bending or breaking or pull off. So that was, that was a classical uh, article by Muller where he used it for dysplastic uh, hips and he when the cage failed in midterm he used another uh, ilioischial cage uh, and the cause of failure was because the cement was between it was there was no bone or the cage was not resting on the host bone well. Uh, the newer implants as uh, uh, the trabecular augments have really made this cage redundant. These trabecular augments are considered biological options whereas conventional cages are considered non-biological options by Paprosky. And the failure of cages is mainly technical or biological failure. That is the graft is supporting is not uh, fails to incorporate. That's the classical way. This is ilio type of cage. It is a Bush Schneider cage. And where there is a lot of misconception in the um, many surgeons, we put this, this is a conventional way. This we put in a cage first and then cement a cup in, uh, in, in, in it. Uh, we have various types of prototypes of this. Uh, uh, the Bushnider, the Gans, these are reinforcement rings, the Muller uh, supporting uh, acetable reinforcement rings. And uh, they are usually, they work, uh, they reduce the stress on, at the inner socket by around 35 to 47 percent. And uh, they are non-biological fixation and they are usually, they, are, they work well when there is, uh, there is no pelvic discontinuity. Uh, we still have these newer com companies making this that suggests that it is still, it has a place. Uh, the failure causes may be uh, various uh, causes. It may be a type of the allograft, freeze dried, fresh frozen, so on and so forth, or irradiated, healing potential of the host tissue, uh, the opposition of the graft and efficient offloading of the graft by the cages. Uh, we have another which is interesting uh, concept which is a cup and cage construct. This is different from your conventional one where we have cup first which is trabecular cup and over it we lay the cage. The cage basically offloads the stresses on the uh, cup while it is being incorporated. Uh, so this is something different and we have different types either it is full cup cage or half cup cage. Uh, uh, construct which we can use that you can use this in the pelvic discontinuity. Uh, if you see the uh, survival rate of these cup and cage construct, if it is without pelvic discontinuity, it is around 91%. If it is with discontinuity, it is around 88%. So they work very well. And it is one, one uh, trick in our armamentarium in these huge defects. If you uh, compare the complication rates of these cape cup and cage constructs with the other uh, options which are available, which is other one is custom triflange cup, the complication rate is the least in cup cage construct around 20% uh, or with 8% revision rate, whereas custom triflange the complication rises to 29%. And we, if you use a conventional anti cage, the, the, there are very high uh, complication rates. We have few cages which can take uncemented shells. So the prototype is octopus, which did not have any biological active coating there, but it could take uncemented cup, it's phased out now. But we have another uh, cage which has coating, which can also integrate and also still can take uh, uncemented cup there. It has, you can put it in six different uh, options of version and uh, 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 the inclination by dialing it in. So that's one of the options. So take home message is, the conventional cages are on the way out. They are non-biological options. We can use the cages with the cemented dual mobility cups also. also. The Alan Gross has used this cage temporarily as uh, if in an infected hip as a first stage. Uh, whenever we are using a, a hemispacer, there can be further loss in the acetabulum. So you can use this cage and use that hemispacer uh, to prevent further loss. 
Cages with the biological acting uh, coating are useful. They take up uh, unsimmetered cups and they have potential for osho integration. Cup cage full and half are evolving is a useful concept. But look at the right side, the marker, the cost is progressively increasing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Akash Sarogi, my co-convener, who will be speaking on bone graft use in complex acetabulum defects. The talk is titled as Bone Grafts Respects Biology. Thank you very much. Thank you, BOS and Vyagog, for this opportunity. And time has come to get out of the cage now. So, let's talk about some biology. Everyone is talking about metals and metals and metals for all the bone loss that has happened. So let's respect biology. Number one, how do I evaluate the defect? So we have the pre-op x-ray, the pre-op CT scan, and of course our intra-op finding which gives us the real picture of how much the bone loss is there. What classification system should I use? Of course we all have been trained in the Paprosky classification. Many of us find it like a maze where so many things need to be really understood to know what Paprosky class it goes into. There are simpler classifications available which really guide your treatment. The one which is quite famous in the Western literature now is the ADC classification, where type 1 is the contained defect, type 2 is uncontained defect, but not classified as structural loss, type 3 are uncontained defect, which are more than 1 centimeter, and now classified as structural loss, and type 4, of course, is pelvic discontinuity. So which grafts are available for what defects? If you look at the original article by Paprosky, he could have used graft for every, every single bone loss case, right from type 1 to type 3b. However, being more realistic in today's era, do we use graft for all cases? The answer is no. For most contained defects, we use large cups, which we talked about, the jumbo cups, with or without the bone grafting. For type 2a, 2b Paprosky and ADC type 2, impaction bone grafting has proven its metal. For 2C, grade 3, and ADC type 3, there is the role of structural bone grafting. Let's talk about some tips and tricks for impaction bone grafting. So, of course, it's a fresh frozen allograft or an autograft of the patient in a complex primary, which helps us with the uh, impaction bone grafting. We make pea sized grafts, as you can see in the picture. Fresh frozen is, be is definitely better than freeze dried. We need to give a lukewarm wash to take out all the fat, which ends up giving a good impaction. The results with IBG, so there is very good outcome and we have thousands of paper talking about this. This is the study that I did in Writington, which was a 10 year follow up study of 126 patients. About 53 had impaction moon grafting, 73 were done without impaction moon grafting, with similar demographic profile and similar, similar acid bone loss. And as you can see, Loosening of the cup, you can see in one case in the impaction bone grafting group and in about four cases in a non-impaction group. If you see the revision rates, only two patients were revised in the IBG group for cup loosening, whereas it was six in the non-IBG group. So mean time to revision, so once you have done the case, so about 14.5 years in the impaction bone grafted patients and about 10.9 years in the non-impaction bone grafting patients. This was a typical case, as on the right hand side you can see a protrusio, a well done cemented hip. Of course there is some linear wear of the plastic, but still a well fixed hip, doing well even at the end of 18 years. Tips and tricks for structural graft. So we need to use smaller size grafts. So we may see that the defect is too huge, and we may take an acetabular uh, graft from an allograft, which may be very big, we need to cut it down because there will be more stresses with a large size graft. This was the original technique which was de described in the Paprosky article where he used a seven shaped, if you can see in the picture, a seven cut graft that the hanging part of the seven will fit on the ileum so that he can put screws from there and those screws will not get into the way of rimming. The trabeculae and the screw direction need to be towards the dome of the acetabulum, so they are parallel forces. What is the long term outcome of structural grafts? So this was a study done by me at Writington. So this, uh, this had a 5 to 40 year old follow up in cases of DDH. We looked at all the revisions. So what was the most common cause of the revision in these cases? Loosening of the cup. And when it came to re-revision, again loosening of the cup. So loosening of the cup was the 
leader in cases of revision for DDH. So all the revisions that were done, we looked at which were the primary cases, how it was done. So in about 21 cases of 88 revisions, the structural bone graft was used as a primary procedure. Whereas in 67, there was no structural graft that were used. If you look at this, in a revision of these cases, where a structural graft was used, only impaction bone grafting was required for revision. Because primarily, some bone was reconstituted with the structural bone graft. In those cases where structural bone graft was not used and a revision was needed, a structural bone grafting was required almost in 27% of the cases later on. So this is one of the pre-op cases, uh, pre-op pictures of the case. A nice structural bone graft can be used. This is a nine year follow up, follow up at 13 years. And this is a nice revision socket where only revision impaction bone grafting was required. The bone was reconstituted. If you look at the other where repeat thing was required. So this was a pre-op case and post-op year there was a graft. And if you see eight years follow up six year, and over six years at 14 years, the screw broke. And this was a case where a full revision with structural graft was required. So bone grafts incorporate, despite the cup failure, over a period of years, your cup may choose to fail. But the structural bone graft that you have used will incorporate into the host bone, making your revision sometimes easier than the primary surgery that you did. That is the advantage of bone grafts. What is wrong with the trabeculum metal? Of course, the cost in our country. What if there is an infection? We all know it is so difficult to remove a trabeculum metal. It does not restore the biology. And what about the revision strategy? It is difficult to remove plus extensive bone loss if you end up removing it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Akash, for that wonderful talk. For the lack of time, we'll have just one quick question. We are privileged to have today with us Dr. Surya Narayanan, sir, who is considered the father of acetabulum reconstruction in this part of the world. So one quick question to you. Sir, how do you decide when to go for a jumbo cup? Or whether you can use an augment to scale down the size of the cup? Yeah, I think you are entirely right. Uh, if you can come to bring it down. As if you can minimize the amount of metal, I think that is always a good idea. And the younger the person, I think the more aggressive should be in conserving. So I think impaction bone grafting is coming back. There's one great indication is the very young at revision. And we have a high volume of primary tips, necrosis, and closing to come. So in those cases, I think impaction bone grafting support is good. But only one thing is when you use the impaction bone grafting for major defects, any metal support in whatever form, then a cemented cup have given better results than the cup on the graft alone. Thank you, sir. Another quick question to Professor Dr. Mohan Desai, sir. So what do you think will stand the taste of time? The acetabulum augments, the uh, jumbo cup, or the cages, or th even the graft? The trabecular option, uh, uh, the, uh, the augments, uh, the <coughs> jumbo cups all have uh, the ability to, uh, you know, uh, also integrate. So they. Uh, they, stand, they have long-term survival, whereas uh, the grafts, especially the morselized grafts have poor survival as compared to the structural graft, especially those uh, massive acetabular allografts are given, given, by, given up by um, Alan Gross because they unite only at the junction, but the entire graft remains avascular for a period of time. It needs to be protected. Basically. Just in second or 30 seconds is, if when you use the graft, morselized seems to take the cake compared to the jumbo in terms of long term. Second is reconstruction and restitution of the bone is the next concept that is coming back. We all are sold always with the trabecular metal and the metals and the custom printed uh, augments, monolithic. But this is more of an American and the transatlantic sort of a receive. But if you come to Europe side one half, they are still conserving. That's where the non cemented cages which can take uh, any type of a uh, tribology, you can even use a ceramic on ceramic. Yeah. But there are multiple uh, junctions of the metal. That is a concern of fretting that is still open to. But I think that concept also will be revisited. Because nothing is permanent, no implant has turned.
Well, you will input one last question from yeah, Professor sir. Mohanty, sir. My, my question to you, Abhijit, that uh, whether you will prefer to put a, you know, bigger cup with a good host bone contact with a flying buttress augment, or you prefer a, you know, put an augment inside the uh, acetabulum having a good fixation, but having a smaller cup with uh, less of uh, host bone contact? So which it depends you, which on would you prefer? On the quality of the bone. So basically, if it's a dysplastic scenario, so usually the best quality of bone is available at a higher level in type 2 and 3 dysplasia. So there we tend to go for a bigger cup, higher hip center. Whereas when it comes to type 1 and 4, the best quality of the bone, where according to Wolf's law, the bone formation it would be better, we tend to scale it get it down and put it over there. Please your comments please on this. Yeah, I think uh, I would prefer once you are going to put a bigger cup, the augment metal is better. I think you can unitize it and uh, get it done. What, where the direction now is going is you are printing the metal to as a monoblock thing so there is no junction also. So I would prefer a smaller cup with an augment, especially in a slightly augment defects and as little as possible. Yes, but the very young, maybe a graft, big. The last part of this session is a trade partner supported academic activity. May I call upon Dr. Vidyanand Raut for his talk on thromboprofile axis for total joint replacement. Thank you, Abhijit. So this talk is uh, on thromboprophylaxis for total joint replacements. As we all know, deep vein thrombosis or venous thromboembolism is a very dreaded complication and if there is no prophylaxis, the incidence is quite high both in THR and TKR almost to the tune of 50 to 60 percent. So it is mandatory to use some form of prophylaxis. And uh, uh, we have a host of anticoagulants available. We have the heparins, enoxaparin, deltaparin. Then we have a vitamin K uh, antagonist that is warfarin. And we have the oral drugs like dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and now epixaban. So which one do we select and how? So the era of the 90s was the, was the warfarin era. There was nothing much available. Then came dabigatran. Then came enoxaparin in the 90s, in the 2000s. And now today we are at uh, uh, a situation where we have rivaroxaban, we have apixaban. And uh, lately we also have, though not available in India, we also have the antidote to these drugs. So this is an overview of VTE prophylaxis. There are different regimens that people follow. Some use low molecular weight heparins followed by warfarin or aspirin in some cases. Some use rivaroxaban throughout, some use apixaban throughout. So which one is ideal? The jury is still out. And uh, if the Slido thing is working, can we have a poll uh, which is the most preferred regimen to use? Enoxaparin plus rivaroxaban is A, enoxaparin plus aspirin is B, then rivaroxaban or apixaban or any other regimen. Can we put up the slido? So it's not working. Okay. Uh, all right. So then we'll skip this. Show hand. Okay. If you have a show of hands for A, Clexane plus Rivaroxaban. Not much. B. So you are fond of aspirin and Rivaroxaban. Uh, aspirin and Clexane. Okay. Only Rivaroxaban. Okay. How many use apixaban in their practice? Okay, it's the new thing. Any other regimen? How many use mechanical devices? Yeah. So, uh, the, the most prudent way would be to use mechanical devices, Floatron pumps, in combination with thromboprophylaxis. So, the side effects of anticoagulants, we all know, or bleeding from all orifices, hematuria, hematochesia, bleeding gums, nose bleeds. But for the most part, the benefits of taking anticoagulants will 
outweigh the risk of excessive bleeding in most circumstances. So how would you define an ideal anticoagulant? The drug should be such that there should be no need of burdensome lab monitoring. Most importantly, there should be very less bleeding tendency. It should have predictable pharmacokinetics. And if possible, it should have an antidote. And of course, the last factor is the cost. It should be easy on the pocket. So the oral anticoagulants that we have today are Debigatran, Epixaban, Rivaroxaban, and Edoxaban. Edoxaban is not uh, approved here in India, but it's used in Japan. The new kid on the block is Epixaban. It was approved by the US FDA in uh, 2014, and it's been marketed in, in, in India uh, uh, 2022, I mean, just a few months ago. So it's a oral factor 10A inhibitor, has a rapid onset of action, a 12-hour half-life. It is very safe to be given in renal compromise, and absorption of the drug is not affected after a high-calorie meal. And if you compare with other uh, NOACs, like Rivaroxaban or Edoxaban or Dabeketran, the one thing that stands out is a significantly lower risk of bleeding compared to these other oral drugs. If you compare, a, do a head-to-head -head comparison between Apixaban and Rivaroxaban, uh, there is slightly more efficacy in terms of VTE prophylaxis, but definite advantage over Rivaroxaban in terms of less bleeding. And the same thing is seen even with Enoxaparin, definite advantage with less bleeding. So uh, I apologize for the crudeness of this slide. So this is how Apixaban acts. It's a factor 10A inhibitor. Factor 10A come in, comes in at the confluence of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways of coagulation. And it acts at this point. Even Rivaroxaban, for that matter, acts at this point, And it prevents the coagulation cascade. So the greater the level of factor 10A inhibition, the greater is the efficacy of the drug. This is because factor 10A is generated much earlier in the cascade than thrombin. Uh, the pharmacokinetics of this drug are pretty uh, convenient and favorable. The bioavailability is about 50%. Elimination half-life is 12 hours. So, to summarize the advantages, it has a clinically relevant reduction of bleeding, major bleeding in almost 70% of the cases. It is safe to be given in patients with renal compromise and with advanced age. There is a better safety profile uh, found with Epixaban compared to almost all other drugs. Adverse effects are there, but uh, nothing to be scared of. Some minor bleeding here and there sometimes, very rare. Nausea, GI bleeding which can be tackled with PPIs. Dosage in uh, VT prophylaxis in THR. The drug is to be given as 2.5 mg twice daily for 35 days for THR. And for TKR, same dose, 2.5 mg twice daily for 12 days. Salient points of the drug, it's a factor 10A inhibitor, has a 12-hour half-life. There is no lab monitoring required. The dosage regimen is quite easy to follow. Thank you. I'd be happy to, uh, for if there are any questions. Yeah. Regarding the Rivaroxaban. Yeah. I would like to ask all the panelists also, like, is there any experience with the wound healing issue, like wound gaping without any in infection because of the anticoagulant use? All the panelists, any of the panelists? Dr. Surya Narayan, sir, would you like to take it? No, we were part of the phase three trials for river oxygen at that time, but we did not find any sort of increase, being, though my colleagues, others do, did report occasional but not so very common of bleeding so it was not a much or not much of a big difference but a tolerance wise there were some issues but of course we use only aspirin along with uh, compression devices so uh, if you have a patient who has got mi or stroke so when do you start aspirin along with this because one is preventing dvt the other one is for stroke or for mi so, when do we start using aspirin with these VT antiprophylaxis? 
Aspen, Aspen can be continued, need not be stopped, sir. You can continue. The old regime of stopping Aspen preoperative and all is more or less given up. You can continue. Clopidogrel gel needs to be stopped yeah. seven days before, but yeah, Aspen can con continue. Yeah. Dr. Mohanty? Yeah, just uh, Ecosprin 75 can be continued, but 150 needs to be stopped. Some people take Ecosprin 150 milligram. That needs to be stopped. My question to you, Vidyanand, that uh, yeah. what about the uh, you know, safety profile of uh, Pixaban in presence of liver disorders. You told about kidney failure, it is safe drug. What about liver disorders? Yes. You know that, uh, you know, Rivarakshavan is, uh, you know, there is some issues with the Rivarakshavan using in kidney failure as well as no liver disorder. About 25 percent of the drug goes through the kidneys, remaining goes through the hepatobiliary clearance. So, yes, if there is a liver compromise, then we'll, we'll need to scale down the drug. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vidyanand Rao. For the sake of the time, we conclude this session. On the behalf of the organizing committee of Viroc Max and Bombay Orthopedic Society, I thank uh, Dr. Subodh Mehta and Dr. Rahul Rane for chairing this session. And thank you for my co-convener, Dr. Akash Sarogi, and all the faculty members, including Professor Dr. Mohan Desai, Dr. P. Suryanarayanan, who flew down specially from Chennai, uh, Dr. Aluk Pandey, and everyone for joining to us. Over to the next session.